welcome. It's so nice to have you with us here again this morning on this lovely, wonderful, sunshiny day. Love is in the air. Do you feel it? Most wonderful God, as we assemble here in this house of joy, deliver us from negative thoughts and wearisome worries. Liberate within us that true spirit that wants to soar with Christ into the boundless possibilities of Easter faith and which worship with the enthusiasm of a true lover. Through him, with him, and for him be all honor and glory and praise to you, most holy God, throughout the world and in the highest heaven. The joy of the Lord Jesus be with you. Maybe I should start over <laughs> since the microphone wasn't on. So back to my announcements. Immediate, that uh, I had to start out with some sad news that the church received word earlier this week that Ted Lyons has died. We have no further information, but the office will send out a blast as soon as we, we learn of any details. There's a special session meeting this Tuesday at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And next Sunday, there's a deacon's meeting scheduled for here right immediately after worship service. As I was saying, we have a special tribute now to make to Don Auer, who will be leaving Springfield, but only going as far as Bridgewater. But we want to recognize him for all the years of service he has had with this church. And if you'd like to come forward, we have a proclamation that was, was created by Linda Jerzak, our office administrator, and I'd like to read it to all of you. It says, in recognition and appreciation, whereas the first congregation of the Presbyterian Church extends its most sincere appreciation to Donald Auer for his dedication and stalwart commitment to the corporate and, and Ecologic, ec, no, the ec, no, ecolo, oh, this is the $10 word that Linda put in here. <laughs> Ecolog, yeah, okay, I'm skipping that word. Concerns of this church throughout his 55 years of membership. Whereas this is not a goodbye, it is fitting to make tribute to Don who with his late wife Elaine have been a part of the fabric of every occasion that this church has celebrated during his time. Whereas, in addition to be, or, being ordained as a deacon and elder and appointed as a trustee, Don provided active leadership in Sunday school, strawberry festivals, vacation Bible camps, 
men's fellowship and historic town-wide celebration and parades. Whereas Don and Elaine Auer not only participated in church activities while raising their children, William, Kathy, Beth, and Karen, but also continued their dedicated service to this church in their post-retirement years, both willingly and lovingly. Now, therefore, we, the members and friends of this congregation, do hereby proclaim our most sincere recognition and appreciation to Donald Auer on this day and always. Amen. And that is for you. And my thanks actually should go out to all of the members who befriended Elaine and I and became our good, good friends and the ones that listen to our stories and listen to our requests for different things and provided the change that was all so easy to make this church function. I provide uh, some support, but the support provided me through those 50 some years was fantastic. I would recommend this place to anyone. I've grown here in many, many ways, and I really acknowledge this certificate of uh, recognition and appreciation and the thank the church so much for it, but they have given me much more than I have provided, and I am so, so, so appreciative of that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now it's my turn. Mr. Ayers, turn around, it's my turn. In addition to celebrating the Lord's Day, we are also here to celebrate the life of Elder Dono Auer. It is so great to see friends and family assembled here to honor Brother Donald. Even though we are of different age groups and have all kinds of jobs and interests, we certainly all have one thing in common, our admiration of a man who contributed so much to the first congregation of the Presbyterian Church at Springfield. The Apostle Paul had a lot of people who caused him many heartaches, and many times in his letters, he said so, but not Philemon. Paul kept hearing good reports about Philemon, how he trusted the Lord Jesus and loved all of God's people. Paul opens this tribute with this word. I always thank God. Wow, what a man Philemon must have been. How faithful and dedicated. This is what I am told about you, Elder Hour. How faithful and dedicated you are, and it has been to the first congregation of the Presbyterian Church at Springfield. I keep hearing of your trust in the Lord Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. After one conversation with you, Elder Hour, I said to myself, this is a good man. He has a good heart, a good spirit, a good attitude, which obviously must have been seen by others because of his good actions and his good deeds. For people to give such a report to me, when we look at this wonderful historical church, we see evidence of all the things you have done to make this place that others would appreciate and admire. You never said, let someone else take care of the church and its members, but instead you said, here I am, Lord, take me. And as an elder, uh, our, uh, uh, in, as elder hour, you begin a new chapter in your life. I hope that everyone here wishes you much joy and love, and you will be missed. But you are only a phone call away, and it is my hope and desire that you will keep in touch with us just to let us know that you are well and happy. I will keep you in my prayers always. In life, we hope that God will say each of us at the end of our life here on earth, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things, and I will set you over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And that was Matthew 25, 21, 
and 23. Respectfully, Pastor Madeline Lindsay. And in addition to that, not through yet, I have a letter that was sent to me from your friend, the Warners. And this is from Loretta. She says, our family will miss Don very much. Don and Elaine were one of the first people of welcome us to this church 42 years ago. We became very close. Don and his family have been a big part of our life. We vacation, have parties, picnics, and church functions together. We remember all the things we had together. You will be missed and hope you come to visit. You are always in our hearts. God bless you. We love you, the Warners. And this is from Loretta. Amen. Amen. And I am so glad that you were able to drive yourself here this morning to be with us so we can bestay, bestow all of this admiration and just bathe you with our love. And I hope you feel it. Well, this church and the Lord has ever more than ever since I stepped through the first portal in my friend and has been concerned about me and caring of me and made me feel at home. This is my home church and I don't think that will ever change. Amen. Thank you. And these flowers are dedicated. Am I wrong, Linda? I'm sorry. Did Linda have something else you wanted to say? Okay. So glad to see your family is here with you as well. Your, your daughter, Kathy, and Stephen. Steve. So nice of you to have been here for you to witness this honor and to see the love that this church has for Don. Amen. All right. I will turn this over now to Loretta, who will do the censoring words. It would be well if we always remembered that practical godliness is the soul of godliness, that it is not talking religion, but walking religion, that pr proves a man to be sincere it is not having a religious tongue, but a religious heart. It is not a religious mouth, but a religious foot, by Charles Spurgeon. Please join me in the call to worship. When fear and doubts stroll through our doors, God stands, stands beside, beside us, us whispering, whispering of, of peace. peace. When we toss and turn late at night, God, God sits by, by our beds, beds singing, singing lullabies, lullabies of, of love. love. When we stumble through the shadows of sin, God illuminates the paths of goodness and joy. Please join me in prayer. Lord of life, submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted on a cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restore to humanity all that we had lost through sin. Throughout these 50 days of Easter, we proclaim your marvelous mystery of death and resurrection. For all praise is yours now and throughout eternity. Our opening hymn is Fairest Lord Jesus.
now this is the time that I take with the children. And we're all God's children. So bring the children in, gather them around the computer, and we'll have children's sermon. What would happen if I got a whole bunch of seed packets to plant a flower garden, and I took the seeds out and put them in the starter boxes? But I forgot to mark the boxes, and the boxes got moved around, and even though the plants are coming up, I don't know which sprout is which flower. None of these sprouts look like the flowers they will become. Hmm, what a great mystery. We will have to wait and see when the plants begin to grow how they will look. Linda, are you a gardener? No, no gardener. Steve, up. Oh, Jill is the, okay, Pastor Jill is the gardener. How about you, Don? Do you, do you garden? I have a garden? You have a garden. And do you specifically have certain seeds that you plant that you want to come up and have a certain look that you want to have in your garden? Do I do vegetables? Oh, oh you're vegetables. Huh? <laughs> so what kind of vegetables do you grow? Carrots. Ooh, carrots. You mean the bunnies don't come and try to get those carrots? No, they don't. Uh-huh. Well, that's a good thing. And Kathy, do you admire your father's garden? Nice, beautiful. Well, that's a wonderful thing. I have no green thumb whatsoever. I buy artificial plants. So this way I don't have to worry them, water them and worry about the sun. But the seeds remind me of our Bible story today. We do not know which flowers the seeds will be when they grow up, but we do know that they will be flowers. When we look at each of you, we do not know what you would be when you grow up either. Some of you want to be doctors or teachers or football players, but we do not know. Lilia, did you always want to be a concert pianist? No. Linda, you? No, actually, I would want to become a singer. Oh, you want to be a concert celloist? Cello? Oh, you play the cello. No, I never did. <laughs> But you wanted to. Yes, <laughs> so you oh. <laughs> so you settle for the piano and the organ instead. Yes. Okay, that's a beautiful thing. And what about you, Kathy? What did you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> I wanted to be a uh, Oh, like a nurse. Yes. Okay, that's nice. And uh, how about you, Steve? Oh, you want to be an engineer? Well, you're close to it now, aren't you? Computer stuff. Yeah, that's like an engineer. Yeah. And we have a guest over here. What's your name, sir? Eduardo. Eduardo. And Eduardo, do you know what you want to be? Are you finished growing up? Oh, an engineer. And what college are you going to college? Oh, NJIT. My son went to NJIT. He graduated as an actuary, and he's the vice president for Citigroup right now. So you never know where things will go. And when I looked at my son, he was so quiet. He never acted like he was interested in anything like that. And surprise, surprise. So you never know what you may end up being. Now, with me, I was always into something. And my parents thought that I was going to be a complete failure. When I would bring home my report card, my mother would take a deep breath and say, oh, Lord, give me strength. And if I got all C's, that was a good day. <laughs> so she always said, Lord, have mercy. I don't know what you're going to become. So she said, you better go to secretarial school, because at least you can always get a job as a secretary. And that's exactly what I did. And that worked out pretty well. And then later on, I went to seminary, 
And who would think that this girl would become a pastor? Lord have mercy. You never know what God's going to put on your heart. But sometimes it could be scary not knowing what will happen to us in the future. We can have fear and worry and doubts arise in our hearts about what we will become. But the risen Lord offers us peace for today and tomorrow. Because of the risen Lord, no matter what we become, we will always be children of God. And that put gladness in our hearts. There is this book called Spoon. And it's written by Amy Krauss Rosenthal. And I thought it was a cute little book. It's about a little spoon that finds himself struggling to make sense of who he is, especially in comparison to his other utensil friends, the knife, the fork, and even the chopsticks. He looks to all the different activities that his friends get to engage in, and he can't do it. But then his mind reminds him of his own unique talents and abilities, emphasizing what makes him special. While Spoon doesn't know what it'd be like to be a knife, a fork, or a chopstick, he does know what it's like to be himself and how he belongs in the larger community of utensils. The writer of 1 John reminds us that we are all children of God, even if it has not been fully revealed what we will one day be. This text and this story explores what it means to belong including celebrating will make someone a unique and special child of God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your mysteries. Thank you for tomorrow. Thank you that I will always be a child of God no matter what. Help me to grow and be the best me that I can be. Hallelujah and amen. Well, that concludes my children's sermon for this morning. And I hope you realize that you are very unique and very special. Amen. Now the call to confession. If our actions merit our words, if our hands were mentored by our hearts, and we walk the talk, we would be God's children. But too often it is our silence, our doubts, our fears, which tells others who we truly are. Let us confess to God how we have not been as faithful as we hope, as we pray, saying the prayer of confession and the assurance of pardon. God of empty tombs, Peter speaks with power and clarity of his faith. While we remain silent, the psalmist speaks of trusting in you while our doubts overwhelm us. Jesus is ready to come and grace us with peace. But our fears keep our hearts sh shuttered and locked. God of full hearts, your love can change us from scared people to children of grace. You can weed doubts from our hearts and plant seeds of joy in their place. You can silence the panic of our souls with the peace of Jesus offers to each of us. Transform us into Easter people through the power of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. We are God's children, those whose lives have been changed by the one who loves us and forgives us. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Now we will have a solo by Ken Young. Bring all ye all the tithes into the storehouse by J.G. McDermott. Accept the Lord, build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Accept the Lord, keep the city. The watchman waketh, but in vain. And it shall come to that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. I 
and shall be exalted above the hill, and all nations shall flow unto it. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Amen. We were to have the reinstallation of Deacon Russell Werner, but he's not able to be with us this morning. So we'll just move along with our prayer of illumination. Please join me with, in prayer. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gra gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Our, our New Testament scripture this morning comes from Acts 3, verses 12 to 19. First, the introduction. To understand Peter's speech is to read it first within its settling, setting in Acts. The speech, the second major address in Acts, is set in the temple of precincts, the, set in the temple precincts. It follows a dramatic healing of a lame man and is addressed to the astonished crowd that was gathered at Solomon's gate, the whole people whom Peter addresses as Israelites. In the simplest terms, this speech seeks to explain to the crowd what the healing means. It is not a sign of Peter's own power or piety, but a sign of what is possible through faith in this name. Now Acts 3, verses 12 to 19. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. 
You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified this, his servant whom, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, who you see and know. And the faith is through Jesus, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. I will be reading the New Testament scripture, the Gospel of, of 1 John 3, 1 through 7. And I will be using the New Revised Standard Version. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who knows what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My message this morning is, we are all alike. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be accept acceptable to thee, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. See how great a love the Father has bestowed, bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Not only did it cost him his son to save us from sin and death and hell, and not only were we enemies so that God had to deal with his own righteousness, anger, in order to save us. But he went away beyond the love of rescue and the love of sacrifice and the love of forgiving his enemies. Because through all of this, he had a greater design. He showed us another kind of love beyond all that. He might have rescued us, sacrificed for us, forgiven us, and not going any further. But instead, he showed us another kind of love. He took us into his family. He made us to be all alike, calling us all children of God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Is there any fam family resemblance? There should be. Aren't we all alike in the eyes of God? Don't take this for granted. First of all, he might not have saved us at all. He might have said, enemies don't deserve saving, and that's that. He might have said, I won't even allow my precious son to pay for angels, let alone ungodly, rebellious humans. But he also might have said, I will save them from hell, 
and forgive their sins and give them eternal existence. Now we encounter this audacious statement. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him, seen him or known him. The expectation is not that we be sinless, because that is clearly impossible. Rather, the expectation is that at least we try. If we find ourselves off track, we will not be content to stay there. We will do our level best to get on track once again. Our beliefs and behavior, as far as humanly possible, match what we do and say. In other words, we do not just talk to walk, we walk the talk. Does that mean we all talk and walk identically? Not at all. There are Protestant Christians. There are Catholic Christians. There are Republican Christians. There are Democratic Christians. There are pro-life Christians. There are pro-choice Christians. There are straight Christians. There are gay Christians. There are crew-cut Christians. There are dreadlock Christians. And on and on and on. There are so many striking differences in this family. But there is one distinction that will ensure that the world would note is the family resemblance. Jesus himself said it. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A Civil War chaplain approached a wounded soldier on the battlefield and asked him if he would like a few verses from the Bible. The wounded man said, no, I'm thirsty. I'd rather have some water. The chaplain gave him a drink, then repeated his question. No, sir, not now, but could you put something under my head? The chaplain did so. And again, he repeated his question. Would you like me to read a verse from the Bible? No, said the soldiers, oh, the soldier, I'm cold. Can you cover me up? The chaplain took off his inside coat and wrapped the soldier. Afraid to ask, he did not repeat his question. So he decided to go away, but the soldier called him back. Look, chaplain, if there's anything in that book of yours that makes a person do for another person what you have done for me, then I want to hear it. Now, that's what I call walking the talk. Putting your words and deeds into action. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are a child of God. You, sure, I should have known. I see the resemblance. You look just like your father. Several years ago, Stephen Carter's book, The Culture of Disbelief, looked at how our society wishes us to treat God as a hobby. Our culture sees faith as something that we should not bring with us into the public square when making decisions about life and how life might be lived. Our society's message is clear. Practice your faith if you must, but please do it privately. First John says no. First John tells us that we believe with what we will determine and how we behave, and publicly, which reminds me of a joke I read. Father Brian, an elderly Catholic priest, was speaking to Father Carl, a younger priest, saying, you had a good idea to replace the first few four pews with plush bucket theater seats. It worked like a charm. The front of the church always fills up now. Father Carl nods and the old priest continues. And you told me adding a little more beat to the music would bring young people back to church. So I supported you when you brought in a rock and roll gospel choir. Now our services are consistently packed to the rafters. Thank you, Father Brian, answers the young priest. I am pleased that you are open to the new ideas of youth. All of these ideas have been well and good, comments Father Brian wisely, but I'm afraid you've gone too far with the drive-in confessional. 
But Father Brian, protested young Father Carl, my confessions have du nearly doubled since I began that. Indeed, replies the elderly priest, and I appreciate that. But the flashing neon sign, to and tell or go to hell, cannot stay on the church roof. <laughs> now, if you are children of God, the world should be able to see the fairly resemblance, and we don't have to keep our identity private, and we don't have to use flashing neon signs. But not everyone who claims to be Christians have yielded to Jesus' command that we love our neighbors as ourselves, and has not understood the lesson of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Everyone is my neighbor, in other words. It cannot be assumed that Christians are actually following Jesus. It is urgent for the sake of the church and of the whole world that we become people who are unswervingly committed to the will and the way of Jesus. People who are bending every energy of their lives to become more and more like him will be agents of reconciliation and understanding, of healing and of hope, of love and mercy. To put it simply, Jesus' people will make the world a better place. God wants to make us like Jesus. That is the clear message of our text from the first letter of John. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. God intends to work in us, with and on us, until we fully reflect the spirit and character of Jesus. How can we become as human as Jesus? Genuine transformation is not a self-help ex exercise or a do-it-yourself project. It is God's work. Transformation happens as God convinces us that we are loved, that like Jesus, we are God's beloved children. The elder John could not contain his wonder at that truth. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and that's what we are. The words God spoke to Jesus at his baptism are words God speaks to, also, to all of us. You are beloved, my son my beloved daughter. With you, I am well pleased. We are invited to experience a relationship with God that embraces and transcends our fondest experience of both father and mother. God's love for us is tender and strong, reassuring and challenging, nurturing and empowering. God's arms of welcome and affirmation are always open to us. We are God's children. We are loved means that you are different enough from the world that you shine like a light, like a little fragrant of God's bright character of truth and righteousness and love. To be a child of God is to be in one sense the most fully human that you can be, what God was aiming at and creating us in the first place. But in another sense, being a child of God sets you off from the world of humans that are not born of God and do not have his spirit. Beloved children of God, remember those whom the rest of the world forgets. Keep company with the fallen and the downtrodden. Work to turn strangers into friends and labor for reconciliation among enemies. Beloved, the elder John wrote, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we will do know is this, when he has revealed it, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, and that's what we are. We are all alike. You and me, we are a child of God. What are we? Yes, that's right. We sure are a child of God. I know that you are because I can see the resemblance. You look just like your Father. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, work in our minds and hearts until we think and feel like Jesus and give us courage to join him in loving and healing the world. Holy Spirit, help us love being a child of God for there is no higher calling. Set our minds on heavenly things. Fill us with your joy. Amen. Together, let us say our affirmation of faith as we can face the face of our baptism. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We we'll now have the prayers of the people. This is the time that we take our concerns and our joys to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God invites us to bring our doubts and our fears, our joys and concerns, our petitions and praise, and offer them for the earth and all its creatures. Oh God, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. His disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the universe in which we are privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share it. This week is Earth Day, so let us remember to respect our earth. Let us do our part to keep it clean. Open our hearts to your power moving around us, between us and within us, and to your glory is revealed in our love of both Jesus, of friend and enemy, and communities transformed by justice and compassion and the healing of all that is broken. Maker of heaven and earth, the beauty of creation reveals your glory and the gifts of abundance that you have given us. You call us to care for the world around us just as you care for us, and we pray that you will guide us in our efforts to be good stewards. O oh, source of light and life, we pray for places where violence and tyranny cause so much suffering. I heard in the news there have been 47 mass shootings alone so far this year. There was one in Indiana last yesterday, and more I heard this morning. We pray for peoples living with trauma and uncertain futures. May greed and hatred loosen its grip on humanity, Holy Spirit, descend upon the many corners of this world and need of your saving love and abiding peace. Our souls are weary with the news of the death of Dante Wright, of George Floyd, of Bianna, of so many others, dear Lord, whose lives have been taken. Another black life cut too short at the hands of a police officer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Shepherd, gathered in your hurting and scattered flock, protect the vulnerable, neglected, and marginalized where peace is tenuous and fear is mounting. We pray for the people of Afghanistan as the United States decides to withdraw from the country by September the 11th. And God, the pandemic still remains the backdrop to our lives. We are grateful for the arrival of vaccinations and the glimmer of hope that they bring. Yet the World Health Organization tells us the pandemic is a long way from over. It is hard not to be discouraged by the news that the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines might have caused some adverse effects. Hold your safekeeping all those working tirelessly and overturn, overtime to research these vaccines. Holy Spirit, come alongside all who are sick, caregiving, and on the edge. Let us pray for our troops who are keeping us safe all around the United States and in the world. Let us continue to pray for those daily departed. They will forever remain in our hearts through all eternity. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and let us pray for those who are on our prayer list, in particular for Russell and RJ and the Warner family. Eileen, Linda, all of our homebound members and friends, Ruth, who will be 100 in July. God bless Ruth. We send all of our best to her. And receive these prayers, O oh God, 
and transform us through them that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do so that your realm will come to fruition and glory. And let us not forget our joys, all the things that God has done for us, the blessing of having Elder Don Auer and his daughter and his friends all here gathered to celebrate his life and time. Lord, be with him as he goes on a new adventure. And Lord, let us pray for all those having birthdays, for all those selling, celebrating their anniversaries, for those who have gotten promotions and who will be graduating from college or from high school or other places. That is truly a joy. And now, let us say the prayer our Father has taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now have the offering from Elder Linda. As an act of thanksgiving to God, let us present our tithes and offerings. And now, just announcing, and now the doxology. <laughs> heart abounds with gifts. Receive this offering as a sign of our, tr of our trust in you and our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to the joy of your presence, hospitable, hospitable to one another, and gracious toward your world. Amen. Our closing hymn is Day is Done.
Amen. The benediction. If the God who raised Jesus from the dead is for us, who dare be against us? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Step out into the world in humble confidence. There is nothing about to happen that God has not foreseen. And no situation where Christ will not be there ahead of you, preparing a place and an opportunity for you. The peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And the blessing of God, all loving, the creator, redeemer, and counselor be with you now and always. Amen. Our postlude is Thine is the Glory by G.F. Handel, arranged by R. Thurgerson. <laughs> 